Caste discrimination has been banned in India since 1948, but it persists and it travels. Seattle has just become the first city in America to ban discrimination on the basis of caste. The city has a large South Asian population, many of them working in the tech sector. But supporters of the bill say the caste system is still being used in the United States to discriminate within the workplace, within housing, retail, sometimes in public places. In the future, it will be identified in its own class, alongside race, religion and gender identity. Caste goes back some 3,000 years. It's a very ancient form of social hierarchy that originally divides Hindus into four main categories. For centuries, it bestowed many privileges on the upper caste, while sanctioning the repression of the lower caste. But no class was more discriminated against than the Dalits, the outcasts. But was the change in the law necessary in a city where South Asians still only make up 2% of the population? Joining me to discuss is the Seattle councillor that wrote the legislation, Sharma Sawan. Very welcome to the programme. Thank you for being with us. Um, you obviously have your own Indian heritage. Have you ever witnessed this kind of discrimination firsthand? I've definitely witnessed it in India where I was growing up and in Seattle and in the United States as a whole. We've had hundreds of oppressed caste workers, as you said, specifically in the tech sector, publicly testify to the city council and talk to me as, as in my capacity as council member that an elected representative of working people that this is happening. And in fact, statistical studies are now recognizing that caste discrimination in the workplace and in other situations is actually has become pervasive and has become a serious issue in the US. Has the Indian dis diaspora in the, in the city responded to the legislation that you sponsored? Because uh, very often you find around the world when this is brought up that Hindus who are politically active aren't particularly supportive of it. As a matter of fact, we wouldn't have won this legislation in the first place without having built a fighting movement that successfully united an overwhelming component of the South, Indian, South Asian community in the Seattle region, not just inside Seattle. And in fact, we had solidarity from South Asian activists across the nation in the United States. And also we had people come in from Vancouver, BC, you know, Canada to support us and South Asians from there as well. And the reason we were successful is was because we obviously united oppressed caste community members and workers, uh, but alongside them, we also brought dominant caste Hindus like myself uh, and who don't personally experience caste discrimination, but want to fight for a society free of caste oppression. We brought Hindus and, uh, sorry, Sikh and Muslims as well. And we brought unions, the Alphabet Workers Union, for example, which represents Google workers, was in solidarity with us for this ordinance. And who was against it, of course, not surprisingly, the mm. Hindu right wing, the far right that is uh, very closely aligned with the Modi regime in India was opposed to it, but there was no surprise. Just very quickly, um, why was the legislation that was already on the statute book not enough? Discrimination on race has been there for a long time. Why couldn't that have covered it? Because the uh, fact is that uh, the uh, the oppressed caste people uh, experience a very specific kind of discrimination, and that is, uh, uh, you know, manifested itself not in the form of race. I mean, just to give you a concrete example, what does caste discrimination in the workplace look like? If you're a tech worker, say at Amazon, which is headquartered in Seattle, and you are an oppressed caste South Asian worker, and your bosses are dominant, so you're South Asian, but your your bosses are also South Asian, but they are from the dominant caste, and the discrimination you experience, you know, being denied raises or promotions, or being excluded from meetings, or being made the target of derogatory remarks or slurs, you know, being made to suffer daily indignities, if that is happening in a way that the people who are perpetrating that against you are also from the same, uh, have the same race as you, then it becomes very complicated in the courts. And that is why, see, it, this is such a major victory that Seattle has become the first ever jurisdiction the globally outside South Asia to recognize caste as a specific form of discrimination. And in fact, I think, you know, since we won this, we've been actually uh, reached out to by people in the United Kingdom, people in England and Wales who have been fighting for 
the mm. same kind of recognition that we have won here, but hasn't happened in the United States. So, for example, activists like Santosh Das, who is the spokesperson of Anti-Caste Discrimination right. Alliance in the UK, has reached out to us. OK, well, we'll, we'll perhaps revisit that. Uh, Sharma Swan, thank you very much indeed. Joining us to discuss in, in broader terms is Isabel Wilkerson. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author of the book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. Isabel, thank you for being with us on the programme. Uh, we're talking about this in isolation in reference to the Indian diaspora, but in your book, you've likened this issue of caste identity to the wider experience of discrimination with America, within America. How so? Yes, well, as we know, and as you mentioned earlier, caste is one of the oldest forms of social uh, hierarchy and human oppression anywhere in the world. And yet it manifests in many respects outside of the originating place of uh, Southeast Asia uh, in multiple ways. One is that when they travel throughout the world, they can carry some of the same uh, originating hierarchies with them. But more broadly, caste is, is a universal form of human division that can uh, surface in any uh, hierarchical society, including that of the United States, which is what has been the primary focus of mine. Uh, caste essentially is an arbitrary, artificial, graded ranking of human value in a society. It's what determines one's value, uh, one's access to resources, mm. uh, competence, uh, even the dehumanization and, and violence that can can be asserted to enforce and to maintain people's place in that hierarchy. Well, that's interesting because there was a really obvious example that occurred to me and that it, it was the suspected murder of Tyree Nichols by black police officers. And at the time, there was a debate, and we had it on this program, about whether this was an issue of race and why black officers would treat a man like that. Are, are you suggesting that maybe there was an element of hierarchy in this similar to what we're discussing? Yes, well, I mean, there's a there's a 400 year old hierarchy that was originating from enslavement, meaning creating a group that would be at the very bottom of the society of what would become the United States, and that those assumptions and stereotypes uh, that uh, the location of pe being at the very bottom, people uh, in in when you're raised in a society such as that, one that is deeply hierarchical and goes back for 400 years, everyone gets uh, uh, programmed, you might say. Uh, to know who fits where, who is valued, who is devalued. And when you have a group that's at the very bottom, assigned at the very bottom, and they, that they are so devalued and so dehumanized that almost anyone can do anything to them, even those in their own group, that's a manifestation of the enforcement of that hierarchy of the social order. And you can have anyone. You do not have to be in the dominating group to, uh, to do its bidding. There, uh, in some ways, a caste system persists because there are sentinels at every rung of that hierarchy. And that is part of what we saw when we saw this in the horrific uh, case uh, involving Tyree Nichols. Just very quickly, uh, you have used before a metaphor to describe what it's like living with this in the United States. You, you refer to a, a house and you as a house inspector. Can you explain that for me? Yeah. Well, I, I think of our country as an old house. And when you have an old house, you may not want to go into the basement when there's been a, a flood or a, some problem in the basement, but you know, not going into the basement uh, means that you're not somehow avoiding that which is, is uh, there plaguing you. Uh, whatever is going on will be lurking uh, regardless of, of whether you know about it or not. Ignorance is no protection against the consequences of an action. But the other thing about an old house is that when you take possession of an old house, you did not build those uneven pillars and joists and beams or the frayed wiring or the corroded pipes. This is not something that you might yourself have done. But once you take possession of it, it is then the responsibility of those who have who are the current stewards of that old house. And I would say that, you know, in any country, uh, those of us living today are those are the ones who are responsible for whatever is going on, whatever is right or wrong with that old house. And any deterioration from that point forward is on the hands of those who are in current possession of it. That's where I want to, to bring in um, our panel, Amisha. 
Um, with reference to the House, in Republican circles at the moment, uh, there are some who don't want to look back at the pillars and where American history was founded. You've got Ron DeSantis in Florida, who could be the next president of the United States, who has banned instruction on critical race theory, who wants to determine which books are read in schools. Is there a danger that if you don't understand race, caste, discrimination, then you're, you're ignorant of it and you can't tackle it in its current form. No, absolutely. If you don't know your history, you're subject to repeat it. I would argue that in America, even in the years that we've taught our history, we've had a really bad, um, a bad trajectory of repetition. There, there are so many things we have never really climbed out of here. No, black people aren't in shackles and chains anymore and being sold on, on blocks to families on plantations. However, there's still a lot to be said about institutional racism. Why African-American women have the highest rates of maternal mortality of anyone in this country, leveling and equaling that that we see in sub-Saharan Africa. Why we still have the inequities in our education system. Why police brutality seems to consistently exist and police officers can moderate and modulate their tone in the way that they um, express themselves and the way that they diminish violence in other communities, but when it comes to the black community, the first reaction is to beat somebody to a pulp or to watch them die. I, I think that there are certain issues here that we have perpetuated over time, quite frankly, because to the previous speaker's point, um, when you have a system that has created a society that basically puts one population of people below everyone else, because in America, African Americans are seen as the lowest of the low, it is very easy to substantiate mistreatment towards them. It is very easy to continue mistreatment towards them. And the times where we have inched towards trying to get to equity, be it whether it was the civil rights movement, be it whether it was the post-George Floyd era that we are currently in, where we're seeing a lot of things get rolled back that we were happy about happening in the immediacy of the protest, it's frustrating because in this country, no matter how far we try to move forward, we continually are pushed back. But we also are seeing a rising Republican Party and Republican rhetoric that is absolutely fine, taking us back to the same notions of white supremacy that existed in the Reconstruction era, that existed during the Jim Crow era, that existed, quite frankly, during the slavery era. Mm -hmm. And Ron DeSantis and his mm -hmm. work in Florida is part and parcel and a good showcase of those things. Julian, our councillor in Seattle said um, that other countries have looked at what legislation they've passed there in the city, uh, and she made reference to the fact that we don't have a similar uh, caste legislation here in the UK. In fact, it was promised in 2018, the government backtracked on it, uh, caste was, a, was going to be a specific mm -hmm. category within the Equalities Act of 2010, and they were going to add it, but then they said there was no need to legally distinguish between race and caste. D does that need revisiting? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do think that, um, anecdotally, I've definitely heard instances of caste discrimination in the UK. Um, uh, so, I, you know, that clearly happens. And wherever you have, um, you know, a large group that has um, brought, brought a system, you know, that's existed for thousands of years, it's likely that, you know, it, that the embedded within among that is going to be some of the systems of prejudice that have come with it. Um, whether it, the right vehicle with which to tackle it is to add it to the Equality Act, I don't know. Um, I think that there are a lot of issues with the Equality Act that we're uh, coming across now and which has, you know, really been highlighted, for example, by uh, the recent, the mess the SNP got itself into in Scotland with, uh, with women and the interpretation of what is a woman. Um, the language the Equality Act uses is, is essentially not specific enough for the debate that we're having now. And the Equality Act, its use has expanded and morphed in many ways, um, according to the way various activists or charities want to define it. And it's, it's being applied in a lot of peculiar ways. Um, so, you know, whether the answer is to add cost to the Equality Act, I'm not sure. But yes, I do think that it's an issue in the UK and that, um, you know, there, sh there should certainly be a way to to refer to it and to use it legally in cases where it's relevant. Yeah, it's an important issue. Not always vi visible, but it is prevalent uh, and uh, recognisable, as we've discussed, across all races and societies uh, around the world. Isabel Wilkinson, thank you very much indeed for being with us.